Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to, uh, to tonight's annual Parliamentary Affairs Lecture. Um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Andrea Ledsam, MP, the MP for South Northamptonshire, uh, formerly Daventry. Um, we were struck lucky uh, in terms of the Parliamentary Affairs Lecture uh, having someone so important to speak. Last year we had, uh, of course, Tom Watson uh, on the eve of, of Leveson. Uh, this year, delighted to welcome uh, Andrea, who's been a very prominent uh, person within the House of Commons since her election in 2010. Uh, just before I introduce Andrea, can I just, uh, just check that you've all got your, your flyers uh, in respect of parliamentary affairs, which tells you how to sign up uh, for free uh, content alerts. And of course the best way, I've been asked by the Hans Art Society, who of course organises the best way to make sure you get your copy of parliamentary affairs four times per year, uh, the most important journal in terms of uh, legislative matters. Uh, the best way is, of course, via a subscription uh, to the Hansard Society. So uh, do make sure you take your, your flyers uh, with you. Uh, there's also a few display copies of the journal in case anyone is unfamiliar uh, with parliamentary affairs. Uh, just a couple of qu very quick housekeeping notes. If anyone wants to come forward, you don't need to all sit at the back. Don't hesitate to, uh, to take their uh, seats near the front. Um, do please make sure that your mobile phones are turned off. And the Hansard Society is tweeting uh, tonight's event, and you can join the online discussion using the hashtag hash PA2013. Hash PA2013. I know that a few people have already um, uh, tweeted uh, about tonight. As I say, we're delighted to welcome Andrea. She's been a very prominent uh, Conservative uh, MP since her election in 2010, with a huge majority, a majority of over 20,000 uh, in South North Northamptonshire, and a swing to the Conservatives of no less than 7.6% uh, during that election. Whether that rates above her getting 4,500 votes in Knowsley South, which is more my neck of the woods, just outside Liverpool, 4,500 Conservative votes in Knowsley South in 2005 probably is about of an equal, as equal an achievement. No disrespect to Knowsley South, if anyone, if this is, this is being recorded. Uh, Andrew has been a, a prominent member of the Treasury Select Committee uh, under the Chair Chairmanship of Andrew Tirry, um, and of course, uh, most prominently of all, she founded the Fresh Start Project, uh, which is working towards a new relationship between Britain and the European Union, and which has already published two very important documents, one a manifesto for change, a new vision for the UK and Europe, and secondly, options for change, renegotiating the UK's relationship with the EU, which sets out some of the areas where repatriation of powers towards the UK uh, might take place. And members of Fresh Start have reportedly been given the green light by David Cameron to uh, enter in discussions with the EU member states as to how this might take place. She's also, uh, Andrea is also co-chair with the Labour MP of the All-Party Parliamentary Group uh, for European Reform. And prior to Parliament, uh, she worked in the banking and finance industry at BZW Barclays and then as head of corporate governance at Invesco Perpetual. So, uh, without further ado, absolutely delighted to welcome Andrea Ledson uh, this evening. Andrea's going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then it's open to questions. Thank you. Well, that was a very kind introduction to what could be a dry topic, so I'm going to have to try and be a bit lively and, and keep you awake. So, the EU without Britain is pretty much the same as fish without chips. That's what the Finnish Prime Minister said in January of this year. And as David Cameron noted in his Bloomberg speech a couple of weeks later, democratic consent for the EU in Britain is now wafer thin. So the subject of accountability and the, the lack of democratic consent in the EU couldn't be more important or indeed more timely. Without democratic consent, the UK's future membership of the EU is unsustainable, and the EU as a whole would be weakened without Britain. So that's why we need to focus on how we can better bring the voters' needs into the heart of the EU to ensure that Britain can remain an EU member. As the Prime Minister also said in his speech, the EU is seen as something that is done to people rather than acting on their behalf. Democratic engagement and effective scrutiny is the only way to put this right. The risks are very high. The future of the UK in the EU is at stake. 
So before addressing the relationship between the European Union and the Westminster Parliament, I want to talk about the bigger picture. I'm going to start with the fundamental problem, which is that the different visions for Europe put forward over the years and the lack of any common vision is why the EU has dashed so many hopes, not just here but across the EU. I'll go on to talk about the EU decision-making process and the role of national parliaments, and that will need le ne lead neatly onto a discussion of scrutiny here in Westminster. And I'll conclude my remarks with some specific proposals for change. I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then if you're still awake, you can ask me some questions. But going back to the beginning, the European project was constructed from several different and conflicting visions. The original aim of the French and German founders was to tie the warring countries of Europe together so that there would never be that awful bloodshed again. And this has evolved from many of them into a vision of ever closer union culminating in, in a United States of Europe. For others, led by the UK, the vision has been vastly different. For a community of nation states trading freely and spreading economic liberalism and democracy. For the UK and others like us, the single market is the core of the EU and our ambition is to extend and deepen it further. And then there's the vision of the former communist bloc, whose countries tend to view the EU membership as a means to prosperity, freedom and security. So there's never been a single shared vision. And the result of the sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone has been a crisis of confidence amongst European people and a large degree of disenchantment with the EU, particularly in the UK, but right across the continent. But I think the differing visions are not totally incompatible. Each could achieve much of what they wish for, but to do this will require an acceptance and incorporation into EU treaties of the concept of a multi-tier Europe. A huge stumbling block for EU accountability comes from the so-called ratchet effect, whereby once a power has been transferred to the EU, it can almost never be brought back to member states. The acquis communautaire, the accumulated body of EU law, has been seen as almost inviolable. Well, to me, that's just ridiculous. Of course, in the first place, powers are transferred voluntarily by sovereign governments to Brussels, but having a series of directives and regulations, many of them well over 40 years old, that can't be changed by a sovereign parliament, even when it's in the national interest to do so, is completely unsustainable. There's a whole series of damaging consequences of EU laws, some of which are real touchstone issues for British voters, that continue to defy resolution at the European level. The Strasbourg Circus is one of them where millions of pounds are spent each year transferring MEPs from Brussels to Strasbourg and back again with their entire staff. In fact, they have a huge trunk outside each of their Brussels offices so they can stick all their papers in it to be loaded onto low loaders and taken by road between different centres. It's a total nonsense. Another is the Working Time Directive, where there's a real damaging impact on the NHS, particularly for the training of junior doctors and for the continuity of care of patients. And there's the unbelievable situation where perfectly edible fish are caught and then thrown dead back into the sea. This one at least is close to being sorted out, but only after huge and permanent long-lasting damage to fish stocks. All these and many others need urgent reform, but the decision-making process in Brussels makes that very difficult to achieve. I'm going to nail my colours to the mast here. I don't think the UK should leave the EU. I think it would be a disaster for our economy and it would lead to a decade of economic and political uncertainty at a time when the tectonic plates of global success are moving. Like the rise and fall of the Roman and Greek empires, we are seeing the rise of the Asian and South American economies at a time when our own future is less certain. And to be honest, economic success is the vital underpinning of every happy nation. The well-being we all crave goes hand in hand with economic success. On the other hand, I think the status quo is fundamentally damaging, not just to Britain's growth prospects from too much red tape, but also to our sense of justice, fairness, accountability and good governance. 
There are too many laws decided in Brussels that would be better decided by our national parliament. And for the EU to succeed, returning powers to nation states is, in my view, utterly vital. And the opportunity for fundamental reform is right now. There will never be a better time to deliver for all of Europe's citizens a greater democratic accountability and a better balance between cooperation and freedom. And as it happens, the status quo in the EU is simply not an option. The Eurozone is forced by events to take the road of ever closer union. And each Eurozone member, as pointed out yesterday by Angela Merkel, must give away a degree of fiscal independence to make monetary union work. This path is now set, and all the evidence shows that the Euro will be protected at any cost. But this path is not one the UK will take. But on the other hand, it does impose on us and all non-Euro states a decision about our future stake in the EU. To be very clear, the UK faces this decision whether it wants it or not. And that's why David Cameron's speech in January was so important, setting out his vision for Britain at the heart of a reformed EU. Our Prime Minister called for a more competitive, flexible, less bureaucratic EU with powers returned from Brussels to Member States. He believes that national parliaments are the real source of democratic accountability in the EU and he called for changes to ensure fairness for all members, Eurozone and non-Eurozone, within the single market. He pointed out the urgent need for change so that the EU is able to compete in the global race. Now for a quick commercial break, I'd just like to mention that the Fresh Start project that I co-founded two years ago has set out in our Manifesto for Change the very specific and detailed reforms that we would like to see the UK negotiate. And I'm very pleased to see that many European politicians and certainly the European press are interested in what we're talking about. And not only that, but there is also a great deal of support, not for everything, but different member states have different interests in different policy areas. So we're not completely banging our heads against a brick wall. There is the desire for reform in the EU and certainly for compromise and negotiation. And David Cameron's reforming speech made very clear that once our renegotiations are complete, we will give the British people the chance to decide the UK's future relationship with the EU through a referendum. Labour denied us that choice when they rammed through the EU constitution that had been repackaged as the Lisbon Treaty. That was hugely damaging for popular consent to our EU membership. And it's one of the reasons why the democratic deficit in the EU is now so stark. Eurozone integration will create both threats and opportunities for all non-Euro member states. A senior German official told me recently that Germany will fix the euro at any cost. That's quite a statement, and it shows the strength of the political will to make the euro work. And let's be clear, the decision to save the euro is a political one, not an economic one. Consolidated government debt to GDP is even slightly lower in the eurozone than it is in, than it is in the UK or the US. So it is economically affordable provided Eurozone members are willing to make the necessary fiscal transfers from the wealthier to the more indebted nations. So the big question is whether the leaders, on behalf of their voters, will be willing to make the compromises necessary. The UK's position on the Eurozone crisis has largely been that we want the Eurozone to sort itself out with our goodwill, but not with our taxpayers' money. But on the other hand, the crisis clearly affects the UK national interest. And there is a potential danger standing aside while the Eurozone sorts out its own problems. I recently met a senior Swedish official who told me that Sweden, another non-Euro member, believes that closer Eurozone integration is not in their national interest, and that so they have a rather different policy to the UK. In fact, all non-Euro member states face a similar challenge. A country called Europe seems to be emerging on our doorstep, and this poses significant democratic questions. So I want to explore further the impact that Eurozone integration will have on democratic legitimacy in the EU, and how we should respond in a new UK-EU relationship. Decisions about public spending go to the heart of democracy. 
Are the nation states of the Eurozone prepared to pass control of these matters to Brussels as a part of moves to shore up the Euro? Can Brussels ever command the deep levels of democratic consent required to support centralised fiscal decision making? The answers to these questions are far from clear. Assuming Eurozone fiscal integration does go ahead, a new sort of West Lothian question will arise in the EU. In the UK, our West Lothian question is whether MPs from other parts of the Kingdom should be allowed to vote on matters that affect only England. And a similar question will arise in the European Parliament, where a decision must be taken over whether MEPs from non-Eurozone countries should vote on issues relating only to the Eurozone. This issue is also being felt in the Council, where for purely Eurozone matters, only Eurozone countries vote. <coughs> But there's a further and fundamental question for the UK relating to Eurozone integration. As the government recently pointed out, it's perfectly possible that Eurozone members will start to vote as a bloc or a caucus in areas that do not directly relate to Eurozone-only governance, such as international trade, single market legislation, social policy or financial services regulation. And they will be able to push through legislation where decisions are taken by qualified majority voting. Although caucusing isn't inevitable, particularly among Northern and Southern Euro members, Britain could find herself consistently outvoted on measures that will have a profound impact on our economy. The solution could lie in extending the double majority lock that was agreed at the time of establishing the European Banking Authority. In those negotiations, for the first time ever, the EU acknowledged the need for two-tier and tailored voting rights, depending on the individual country's status either inside or outside the Euro. Now stick with me because if you don't know what double majority voting is about, it is a bit tricky. But basically when the European Banking Authority makes decisions using QMV, which is qualified majority voting, it will also be required that a simple majority of countries who participate in the banking union and a majority of countries who are not in the banking union must be in favour of the measure before it can pass. Now what this means is that the ins can never use an inbuilt majority to impose their will on the outs. It establishes a very important precedent in how to reconcile further Eurozone integration with the single market which, of course, belongs to all 27 member states. During recent discussions with EU officials, I've been given the, outside of the UK, I've been given the impression that voting reform to give non-Euro countries the double majority lock on all EU decisions could be on the table. Now, if that's true, that would be real progress in greater accountability and the protection of British national interest. And that brings me neatly onto the subject of the EU decision-making structure more broadly, the interaction with national parliaments and the process of scrutiny here in the UK. First I want to examine the current arrangements before moving on to suggestions for change. So the three organisations that are central to EU decision-making are the Council, the Parliament and the Commission. The Council is where member state governments are represented. It usually operates under a qualified majority voting system where voting weights are decided based on a country's population. So currently we have around 8% of the votes, so the UK can be outvoted and EU laws imposed upon us. Recent legislation on city bonuses is a good example. The European Parliament is supposed to make the EU more accountable to the people. The Lisbon Treaty radically increased the power of the European Parliament and in around 40 areas of policy ranging from agriculture to criminal justice, the European Parliament was given equal power over EU legislation with the Council. The European Commission, on the other hand, is meant to work in the common European interest, but since there is such a lack of consensus on almost everything, it tends to have a lot of leeway, shall we say, in defining what that interest is. As a rule, the Commission has the exclusive right to propose EU laws. The European Parliament and the Council cannot do so and cannot require the Commission to do so. A key underpinning, however, of the Commission's mandate is that all proposals must respect the principle of subsidiarity. 
Basically, what this means is that the EU should only legislate where policy is best made at EU level rather than by the member states themselves. The Lisbon Treaty gave national parliaments a role in monitoring whether subsidiarity is in fact being respected, and this is where the yellow and orange card system come in. All Commission documents must be sent to national parliaments and the Council at the same time, and then national parliaments have eight weeks to scrutinise those documents. Then if a third of national parliaments think a piece of proposed EU legislation goes against the principle of subsidiarity, in other words we could do this better at home, then a yellow card can be issued. This has nothing to do with football. The Commission must then review the proposal and either withdraw it or resubmit it, either amended or in exactly the same form. So that's pretty weak then. An orange card, on the other hand, arises if a majority of national parliaments think a proposal breaches subsidiarity. In this case, if the Commission has the temerity to resubmit the same proposal after reviewing it, then the Council and European Parliament have to assess specifically whether the proposal meets subsidiarity. Now, of course, they should be doing that anyway under the EU treaties. So again, the teeth in the orange card system are very blunt. Sadly, more than three years after this system was introduced, I understand the yellow card system has only actually successfully been used once, and the orange card system not at all. I'd be interested to know if anyone's aware that that might not be right. It's been astonishingly difficult to um, get to the actual answer on that point. So the body supposed to help national parliaments to coordinate their EU activities is known as COSAC, not a Russian dancer, but the Conference of European Union Affairs Committees. It consists of representatives from national parliaments as well as MEPs, and it's met every six months since November 1989. In the Lisbon Treaty, COSAC was given the power to submit opinions to the European Commission and also to scrutinise any legislative proposals in justice and home affairs that might affect individuals' rights and freedoms. However, COSAC is funded by the European Parliament and its agenda is set by the European Parliament, so its independence is distinctly questionable and, of course, its contributions are not binding, so they can effectively be ignored. So what then about scrutiny of EU decision-making within national parliaments? Well, essentially there are two principal forms of scrutiny systems, and now this gets really dry. There's the document-based and there's the mandating. Each one, as you'd expect, has its strengths and weaknesses. The UK uses a document-based system, whereas Denmark, for example, operates a mandating system. And I'm going to briefly look at each in turn, the pros and cons. So document-based scrutiny that we use in the UK focuses on legislative proposals and other EU documents. It doesn't focus on council meetings themselves and it doesn't seek to mandate ministers. In the House of Commons, the European Scrutiny Committee reports to the House on the EU documents it considers to be of legal or political importance. It also decides which documents should be discussed in the Chamber. In the House of Lords, the European Union Select Committee conducts regular scrutiny of proposals, writes to ministers to pursue significant issues, and produces a large number of reports each year. Now, the strengths of that system are that scrutiny takes place on the basis of actual proposals rather than on thoughts or suggestions, and it does allow specialised knowledge to emerge. Now, some people might not agree with the wonderful Bill Cash on everything, but nobody could doubt his deep knowledge of EU um, and its treaties. Second strength is that in theory all documents are covered, which allows parliamentarians to keep a watch on the EU's extraordinarily wide-ranging activities. And the third advantage is it does tend to allow more parliamentarians to get involved in scrutiny, as documents are referred to other committees or to the Chamber for discussion. But there are clear weaknesses of this system, and the key one is that scrutiny only takes place, only begins when a document is actually issued. So although we wouldn't want to be scrutinising just ideas that are being floated within the European Union, at the same time we would like to be further in advance, so that instead of what happens now, where we're often scrutinising something at the 11th hour, where it's all but done and it's very difficult to change it, we could get ahead of ourselves and, and start looking at these um, measures earlier. 
Second disadvantage is that Parliament can only respond to what it's presented with by the scrutiny committee, so the power is in their hands to decide what Parliament looks at. Thirdly, there are so many of these documents that it's actually the scrutiny has been described as censorship by mass because it's impossible to look at all of them. And then finally, there is a heavy reliance on the scrutiny reserve rule, where in theory the UK government is prevented from agreeing to any EU proposal until it has been scrutinised by Parliament. However, the government can override this proviso on the grounds that it doesn't want to cause delay. So then mandating systems, such as used in Denmark. This system looks at the decision-making process as a whole rather than at specific documents. So in this system, the scrutiny committee concentrates on questioning ministers before council meetings and establishes a national negotiating mandate. For example, the EU Committee of the Danish Parliament summons ministers every Friday to discuss the following week's business at the council. And then the committee will give the minister a negotiating mandate from which he or she can only depart if the committee is consulted. Now, the strengths of this is that important issues are less likely to be overlooked, there's always a national position, and there's an incentive for the government to provide committees with all the relevant information in good time. The disadvantages, of course, are primarily that if you're the minister and you're going to negotiate, if you keep having to ring home to get permission to move your position one inch, it's not a very strong negotiating position. And in fact, many of the... Uh, many of those mandated ministers find they're completely not talked to in European meetings because nobody thinks they have the power to change their mind on anything. So that's not a perfect system either. In fact, I spoke recently with a senior ex-minister who'd been closely involved with European issues. He described our scrutiny committee as one with no teeth. He said ministers simply turn up, answer a few questions and then go and do what they were going to do anyway. He described decision-making at the level of 27 in the EU as exceedingly complicated. He noted, however, that ministers from countries with a mandating system spend most of their time during negotiations on the phone, seeking permission to move just an inch. So there must be a better system, perhaps a halfway house between the two, one that keeps the merits of each, where in-depth scrutiny is carried out on documents but that also includes ministers appearing before departmental select committees or a European committee to discuss the issues that allows the minister to use the committee as a sounding board and to get their head around the issues and also to get a broad mandate. This would have to take place far in advance of any negotiations in Brussels and then the minister should return to the committee to talk about how, how well they'd done. So the UK system is OK, but it could be a lot better. And I'm very pleased that the European Scrutiny Committee is, in fact, holding a detailed inquiry into the way scrutiny works here, and I'm looking forward to its report. But I want to return now to the democratic accountability of the European Parliament. Frustratingly, it seems that increasing the power of the European Parliament has so far been the EU's main response to its democratic deficit, and this hasn't been a success. At each significant treaty change, the European Parliament has got more power. And we're still asking questions about the democratic deficit, so it hasn't done very well. If the European Parliament were a simple answer, we wouldn't still be asking these questions. The truth is that EU-wide turnout has fallen at every single European parliamentary election since it became directly elected in 1979. In 2009, across the EU, it stood at 43% turnout, it was 35% in the UK. In almost all EU countries, the turnout in national elections is significantly higher than in European. Few people can name any of their MEPs. And when I was elected, I'm sorry to say, I actually had to look up the names of my MEPs. So that's pretty astonishing. So why is the European Parliament failing as a democratic body? Well, one factor might be the activity of MEPs themselves. The usual function of any parliament is to hold the executive to account on behalf of the people. Yet the European Parliament does no such thing. All too often its overriding objective is to increase the power of the EU and of the European Parliament. There's also a question over how much influence a vote for one MEP can have over EU decision making. The European Parliament shares legislative power with national governments in the Council and, like the Council, cannot actually propose new laws. 
So the Parliament does not obviously shape the political direction of the EU. And in addition, the EU's decision-making structure is opaque, even to those of us who take the time to examine it. So voters can't really see how their vote can make a difference. The way we elect MEPs also plays its part. In Britain, we've had very large constituencies for MEPs since 1999. In England, these are based on completely artificial regions that mean nothing to anyone. We've also had, since 1999, the closed list electoral system, which involves multi-member constituencies and electors voting for a particular party's list of candidates rather than for individual candidates. Seats in the constituency are allocated to parties according to the proportion of votes that each party receives. The candidate's position on the list, which is decided internally by their party, determines whether that candidate gets one of their party's seats. So for all major parties, as long as a candidate is at the top of their party list, they will almost certainly get elected. So consequently, there's a huge incentive for MEPs to stay in their party's good books, rather than to look for what the voters want them to be focused on. So a different electoral system might improve the democratic legitimacy of MEPs in the UK. Personally, I would favour far smaller constituencies and a first-past-the-post system to reinforce the links between a voter and their MEP. But there's an even more fundamental reality, and that's that too often those who vote in European elections will do so on the basis of national politics. European elections are often used by voters to give the national government of the day a bloody nose. In short, to use the words of the Prime Minister again in his January speech, there is not, in my view, a single European demos. In other words, there is no common European political identity to underpin a single European Parliament. Unfortunately, there are some in the EU who are not willing to recognise this reality. Commission President Barroso said in his State of the Union address last September, there is only one European Union, one Commission, one European Parliament. Addressing the European Parliament, he added, this is the house of European democracy. We must strengthen the role of the European Parliament at the European level. It's clear that centralising more power in the European Parliament is not the cure for the democratic deficit. So again I turn to our Prime Minister, who said in his speech in January, it is national parliaments which are and will remain the true source of real democratic legitimacy and accountability in the EU. And then he said, we need to have a bigger and more significant role for national parliaments. I agree with him. We have to find a way for national parliaments to be more influential in Brussels. So now to cut to the chase, how can we improve EU decision-making to increase democratic legitimacy? Well, I've got a number of suggestions which I've grouped into four key areas, and I'm calling them Better Westminster Scrutiny of EU Proposals, Secondly, getting Westminster better at working with others. Thirdly, giving the EU more of a hug in Westminster. And fourthly, forging real change in Brussels. So first of all, better Westminster scrutiny of EU proposals. At the moment, if the European Scrutiny Committee thinks an EU proposal is important, it will refer it to European Committee A, B or C for debate. These committees have temporary membership by MPs, which doesn't allow members to build up expertise. In my experience, most MPs actually consider them a chore. So making membership of these committees permanent, and perhaps having them more specialised by policy area, would certainly help. We should use the expertise of, department, of departmental select committees, like the Treasury Select Committee that I'm a member of. We should be more involved in the pre-legislative scrutiny of EU proposals, and the quality of this scrutiny could be improved by appointing an MEP with a focus on that area to periodically report to the specialist select committees. I would also like to see EU officials to be much more responsive to national parliaments and select committees. For example, select committees should be able to summon European commissioners or senior staff from the Commission or UCREP, who are the officials representing the UK in Brussels, to appear before us the European Scrutiny Committee or the relevant departmental select committee should also be given the right to veto senior UK appointments, for example to the Commission or to UCREP 
or to the um, European Court of Justice. The mandate of the European Scrutiny Committee should also be broadened. Currently, its mandate is to decide if a proposal is politically or legally important. A broader remit would ensure it could comment on the merits of individual proposals and make suggestions for future policy. We should also introduce a mechanism to forewarn Parliament of policy developments at an earlier stage. That would help this place to engage and really influence <coughs> European legislation. UCREP should have a specific responsibility to notify the European Scrutiny Committee and relevant departmental select committees of significant proposals at a much earlier stage. So secondly, getting Westminster better at working with others. So there are two main aspects to this. The first is making the yellow and orange card system more effective and the second is working more closely with MEPs. Now I think the yellow and orange card system could be made more effective through improving the effectiveness of COSAC. COSAC should meet more frequently and it should be totally independent of the European Parliament. If this can't be made to be effective, then a more radical proposal should be considered like developing a second chamber such as a Senate. Uh, the Bundesrat in Germany would be quite an interesting model to base this on, but I have to say the obvious danger of this is it simply proves to be another layer of bureaucracy, but I do think that idea deserves more thought. The threshold for issuance of the yellow and orange card should be lowered, and the amount of time given to parliaments to scrutinise proposals should be lengthened. The orange card system could be upgraded to a red one, allowing, a, the, uh, allowing for a simple majority of national parliaments in the EU to block an EU proposal outright and not just on grounds of subsidiarity. The card system could be expanded to include existing regulations and directives. So if, for example, 12 national parliaments sought repeal or amendment of an existing EU policy, the Commission should be compelled to bring forward proposals to change it. The red card could be used in a similar sense to immediately repeal EU legislation. The second area that Westminster needs to be more effective is in working with MEPs. We have to improve the cooperation between MEPs and MPs and encourage MEPs to act as an early warning on EU legislation coming down the track from the EU. Something as simple as giving MEPs door passes for this place would be an easy step. MEPs should play more of a role in checking how we interpret EU directives into UK law. All too often in the UK, EU directives have been gold-plated, going beyond the original intention of EU policymaking. So having MEPs brief MPs on policy intentions and checking how the policy is implemented would be a very positive change. So my third area for change is giving the EU more of a hug in Westminster. And what I mean by that is that for too long, Britain has been the reluctant bride. And Giscard d'Estaing put it very well once when he was here, before I was elected actually some time ago, trying to sell us the idea of the Lisbon Treaty and saying, of course, it's the EU constitution, but yeah, we won't go there. Um, but what he said is that Britain is always the problem because we are always the reluctant bride. We walk up the aisle looking enthusiastic, and then we walk back down the aisle looking distinctly miserable. And that actually he was urging us to get ahead of the game, stop sort of waiting till 11.59pm before we decide this doesn't work for us. So um, being more closely involved I think is absolutely critical at this time of great change. European issues need to be given more priority in Westminster. Personally, I think the Minister for Europe should be a cabinet post with overall responsibility for European policy. And this could be combined with a new European questions in the House to follow the weekly business questions. The European Commission's forward programme should certainly be debated each year on the floor of the House. There also needs to be a cultural change amongst MPs and civil servants so that exposure to European issues becomes an advantageous part of career development. Certainly in this place, some MPs don't engage in the detail of European issues because they're so opaque and frustratingly complicated. And so finally, forging real change in Brussels. 
So I think the best way to ensure democratic accountability is to connect European decision-making more closely with national governments and national parliaments, and through them to citizens. For me, the best decision-making is made by those closest to the people affected. And the best way to realise this is to return a number of competences back to member states and to apply rigorously the principle of subsidiarity. The Fresh Start project has proposed several areas for repatriation of competence, and I look forward to supporting a Conservative government in its own negotiations for reform. And I should say at this point that my proposals are my own. I'm neither speaking for the Fresh Start project and certainly not for either the Conservative Party or for the Coalition Government. But I will go on to talk about um, some of the specific proposals that I would like to see. So the very real issue of a sovereign government being outvoted in Brussels under qualified majority voting and a law being foisted upon a nation against the will of its government and its people needs to be addressed. An expansion of the emergency break procedure, perhaps accompanied by the greater use of enhanced cooperation of willing member states, would be one way of doing it. The emergency break would allow any member state that considers a proposal to be a threat to subsidiarity or to an important national interest to refer that proposal to the European Council where unanimity and hence a national veto would apply. Now one way of doing this would be to institutionalise what's been called the Luxembourg Compromise, which in fact is something that doesn't exist, but it was put forward many years ago um, by national governments as a means to try and defend their biggest national interests. And to have some sort of recognition within the EU that different nation states do have particular areas of policy that are of significant interest to them and that, that where they must therefore have the ability to resist fundamental change that they feel is against their national interest, I believe would be very key. Now I've already mentioned the clear advantage of an expansion of the double majority system of voting to ensure that the Eurozone does not consistently outvote the non-Euro members. This or a comparable system should be a top priority for reform. I think that would be a really important way to ensure that Britain and others who don't seek to join the Euro should be able to achieve the protection of their voting interests. Otherwise, we really do face being disenfranchised further down the line. Next, we must find a way to tackle the acquis communautaire, the body of EU law that has developed over time. I think all new EU directives should have a sunset clause, which is the date on which that rule expires unless it's deliberately renewed. This, together with the expansion of the yellow or red card system to include existing directives and regulations, would represent major reform. If this proved not to be effective, we should go further still, and we should consider allowing each change of national government a window of opportunity to opt out of EU directives or regulations that previous national governments had signed up to. Some or all of these measures could help the EU to close the democratic deficit and to improve the quality and democratic accountability of lawmaking. Ultimately, however, I must return to where I started, the big picture of Europe. We, as British politicians, must spell out clearly the EU that we think our country should be part of. And then we have to project and promote that vision. We must then let the people decide whether or not our future lies with the EU. As the Eurozone changes, it creates the unavoidable need and the huge opportunity for the UK to redefine its relationship with the EU. The UK must help to create an EU with the single market at its core, but where our citizens feel that they have a real say in the laws that govern their lives. In some cases, this will mean decisions take more time and that our disagreements are aired. But this is an inconvenience that is well worth the price if it means creating some genuine democracy in the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. We now have some time for questions from the floor. I believe we have microphones, or do we not have microphones? We do have microphones. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. So if, um, when you want to ask a question, if you could wait for the microphone to reach you, please. Uh, 
say who you are uh, and if you represent some institution, whatever that institution is. Um, we want no um, reluctant brides here. I expect you to rush forward, uh, whatever the opposite of a ru- an eager bride. So we want you to be very eager brides and rush to grab the microphone. Uh, so who'd like to ask the first question, please? Uh, one at the front here. <coughs> Oh, they're already mic'd. Okay. Um, hello, I'll plunge in. Um, my name is Monica Threlfall. I'm a lecturer at London Metropolitan uh, University. I'm just going to plunge straight in because my question is about the sort of core concept of, of democratic deficit. This has long been argued on both the right and the left and independence and so on. But I never understood it. Uh, understood. I mean, I never see where the deficit is because the structure of the EU is clearly a federal structure. There is, uh, uh, with, with the council that you mentioned, representing the Senate with their two legislative bodies, just like in national parliaments. Um, if you, the, the structure mirrors that of any national body. So actually, strictly speaking, there is no democratic deficit ever since the European Parliament is voted in directly. There's nothing that doesn't happen and, and, and if you want to feel more familiar about it, think of the United States. Of course, people in Arizona don't you know, feel that they're close to the decision-making in Washington. I mean, that happens in every country, and a very big country like the EU, if you look at it as a country, a federal state, is that. So um, the only point of concern would be the fact that that uh, the turnout to the European elections isn't as high as one would like it to be. But of course, when the turnout in the US did never, didn't reach 50%, which it did not for decades and decades, none of us in the UK thought of considering telling them that they were not a democratic country. Because legally, 50% you know, majorities don't have to exist for a country to be considered democratic. And what we should do is encourage people to vote, and I don't think either Labour or Conservative Party has really done very much to push voting for the European Parliament. So I would like to see that. I think that would be the immediate answer to your consideration mm. about and that really, really change. Otherwise, there is no structural democratic deficit. Mm. Though I welcome all the scrutiny things, but if you've joined a club, uh, and if, I mean, if you are you know, just a region, like the UK is a region, you can't be de- necessarily demanding repatriation because the whole point is that you have, we are part of a federal type structure. Okay. There you go, well, I mean, that, that's a, I'm very glad that you've come at it from that angle because that really highlights the difference between those who believe that Europe is and should be the United States of Europe and those who believe that Britain mm-hmm. is a sovereign territory. I fervently believe that Britain is a sovereign territory. We didn't sign up to a United States of Europe and I don't think most people in Britain did either. And therefore, everything you're saying merely highlights that the democratic deficit is extraordinarily real because of the lack of a shared vision about whether we are or are not part of a European States of Europe. I mean, actually, it's, it's quite astonishing to hear you say that. I don't very often find people who are willing to say Europe is a country. I mean, even, um, no, even President Barroso himself. Mm. Well, no, but it's comparable is, yeah. you know, but it's not at all. Britain is a sovereign state in a way that... Um, As you mentioned, Arizona isn't a sovereign national territory. Britain is, and that's the fundamental difference between us. But we've given that up. No, we haven't. When we joined. Britain absolutely hasn't. We've got a question in the middle. Chat with the yellow tie and then... Thank you. Uh, Peter Knowles, uh, BBC Parliament. Do you think that some consideration should be given to whether the scrutiny committees here should be joint committees of the Commons and Lords? Um... I, t- I mean, at the moment, the feedback from MEPs is that the Lords scrutinise um, EU legislation much better than the Commons do, um, and, and that they're, they're far more engaged with it. So, um, I mean, I, I don't quite know how to answer your question. I'd have no objection to it, but I, I think that um, the advantage of having the lower house democratically elected and the upper house free of political considerations, scrutinising the same thing. I think they could potentially come at it from different perspectives. And so actually, I mean, off the top of my head, I've never considered it, but off the top of my head, I I think I'd prefer them to be separate because the lower house will always be much more concerned with democratic accountability, I suspect. I could be wrong in that, but that would be my 
initial thought. Uh, Roger Casali, New Europeans, uh, a new organization promoting European citizenship. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Andrea, I don't feel that uh, we live in a European uh, super state, uh, and I don't think that uh, Britain's sovereignty is, I don't go to sleep at night uh, anxious about Britain losing uh, its sovereignty. I think its uh, sovereignty is pretty safe for now. But having said that, I do feel, uh, I'm afraid, that I live in a country called Europe, and I am proud to be a citizen of Europe. Uh, and New Europeans is promoting the idea of European citizenship uh, because citizenship is, uh, and, uh, is about identity and I think we do have uh, an uh, identity in Europe. I think it's as cultural as much as it's political and it's something that I'm proud of. Uh, I think you see that particularly strongly when you come into Europe from outside. So um, I think we, we just have to get over this. Um, and accept that um, the world is changing, it is interdependent, and we need new forms of organisation. And I think one of the things that European citizens want, though, and here I'm with you, is a decision-making uh, process that is much more accountable and where there's much better quality. I mean, for example, you didn't mention the fact that the European Commission doesn't have its accounts audited, which well, isn't yeah, good. So yeah, it's yeah. But I'm not sure that the solution, I think we need a broader vision. I'm not sure the solution lies just in the European Scrutiny Committee which I was a member for many years when I was a member of this house. Uh, although I like to, I mean, some of, and some of the ideas you're talking about, we were talking about, we were talking about then. Um, and I think that they, that they will help. But if I may just say this, and sorry, I don't want to sort of speak for too long. You started your speech by talking about uh, Britain's relationship with Europe in terms of fish and chips. And the image that was coming into my mind as you were speaking is that this is somebody who wants to have their cake and eat it. And the reason I say that is because, um, on the one hand, you want to have the single market. And I think for you, the single market is really uh, pretty much what European Union should be about. But then you tell us that you don't want to have more qualified majority voting. In fact, you want to repatriate power so that Britain has, so there's more unanimity. But we know from Margaret Thatcher that the way to get the single market is actually to increase qualified majority voting, not to, and to decrease it. Similarly, you say you want to have Britain having more influence, um, but probably our influence at the moment is at an all-time low. And part of the reason for that, I think, is the, uh, the fact that we continuously give the message to our partners in Europe that we just don't get it in terms of European cultural identity. And I think that um, people are fed up with us, and they'll stop listening to us. And I think that our, our influence now is at an all-time low. And if we try to get, under this Conservative government, the type of concessions that we got under John Major with the Maastricht Treaty. I think, um, well, I, I'm very sceptical that that would be achievable. Mm. And I wonder what you would say in response mm. to that. That's a sort of question. Yeah, sort of question. Okay, well, I couldn't agree with you less. For a start, I think our, um, all of the evidence that I have from talking to ambassadors and European politicians is they are extraordinarily interested in not wanting to sort of um, name anyone because having not asked their permission. But I can absolutely assure you that with some of the reports the Fresh Start project has done, other member states are looking, asking for our reports on, for example, how the EU has damaged the NHS, um, the impact of the EU on micro-businesses, um, some of our proposals for reform in the area of immigration. So um, other, other EU member states are very interested in what we're doing, very engaged, and I have extraordinarily positive meetings. And, you know, a very senior German official said to me, only a couple of weeks ago, with a group of colleagues, with plenty of witnesses, that, that there is almost that, that Germany will bend over backwards to keep Britain at the heart of the EU, and that's absolutely what was said to me by a very senior person. And so I couldn't agree with you less that our, our influence is at an all-time low. Number one, number two, you say I want less QMB. I'm not saying that actually. If I didn't explain myself well, then I apologise. What I was saying is I like the double majority lock. The problem we have is as the voting rights change in, I think it's November next year, um, we will be outvoted on everything. We will be disenfranchised by the Eurozone if they vote as a caucus as a result of the changes in demographics and the new accession countries and so on. The Eurozone will be able to, under QMV, outvote us on everything if they work together. We cannot be disenfranchised. I'm not talking about less QMV. I'm talking about preserving our ability to retain our share of the influence. So that you've sort of slightly distorted what I'm saying. I'm certainly not talking about having my cake and eating it, and nor do I think the single market is the only thing that we should be doing with the EU by any means. And uh, yeah, I don't want to sort of 
go into exactly what I do think, because probably no one else cares. But um, um, I certainly don't. I certainly don't think it's only the single market. But again, it goes back to what this lady was saying: Are we a sovereign nation, or are we just a, a region of an EU country? We are and will be a sovereign nation, and so therefore, what we've absolutely got to do is to have take our citizens with us in that sense, and so that requires massive change at home in our in our sort of negotiations with our fellow EU countrymen and perhaps yes to the EU treaties as well. Any more questions? There. Oh, brilliant. Uh, we'll take the uh, woman on the left there in the um, no right behind you right behind you. Oh, okay you don't want to ask a question. Go on go on ask the question first. Hello um, Anastasia Karaja I'm a PhD student in University of Surrey I realize that um, I, I understand from your speech that the emphasis on your on your proposals for more um, democracy or for alleviating the problem of the democratic deficit is based on increasing uh, the powers of the national parliaments. And I was wondering if if you haven't placed such um, emphasis on increasing the European Parliament's powers instead because so far, the experience has shown that this is not the way to to um, address the democratic deficit. Um, so, hang on, I just need to understand exactly the question. Are you saying you think that increasing the powers of the European Parliament would be a better way to improve the democratic deficit? I'm not. I'm not suggesting. I'm just asking you why you would prefer to enhance the powers of the national parliaments instead of proposing a, a an enhanced um, role of the European Parliament, since yeah. the treaty provides that it's the it's supposedly the the institution that is representative of the European citizens. Yes. Well, I think I, I tried in my speech to explain that um, there's all sorts of reasons why the European Parliament doesn't answer the question of the democratic deficit. Um, you know, for a start, the, the, the constituency size, the way we vote for MEPs, the turnout's very low, the understanding of the European Parliament's very low, the motivation of MEPs is often, you know, normally members of Parliament are holding the executive to account on behalf of their electorate, and that's not the case with MEPs. That's, that's, not, the, that's not the way it's structured. So um, what I believe is that European parliamentarians, because of the huge number of countries, are unable to really defend individual member states' interests. And so therefore, you need to have a stronger check and balance at the national state level in order to be able to protect national sovereign interests. So, I mean, again, if you believe in a federal states of Europe, you don't care about national sovereign interest. But if you do believe in an EU of 27, soon to be 28, sovereign states who are cooperating, then you need to be able to defend your sovereignty when the time comes. And the European Parliament is simply not structured in a way that it is able to do that. Um, there was a chair, a chair, a little bit further along. Brilliant. Thank you. Tony Gilland uh, from the Institute of Ideas. I've got two questions for you, if I may, uh, brief ones. First of all, your, uh, your understanding of cultural identity. I think it's a very interesting area for debate and discussion, the European cultural identity and political identity and shared history. Uh, I don't think that's the same as inventing a country, by the way. I'm, I'm quite amazed that people can just invent Europe as a country uh, and think we won't notice. Um, but, but, but I do think there's something quite important in that concept of shared histories and traditions. That is, uh, and I would like to know what you think about that and what that means to you and your vision of Europe. But secondly, on the democratic deficit, it strikes me it's not simply a question of voting. Uh, democracy is about more than voting, it's about our attitude towards uh, people, our attitudes towards the voters, what we think people are capable of and how much trust we give them. Uh, and it's not clear to me uh, that, 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 that the situation in our own country is so strong in terms of the vibrancy of our political scene, in terms of the visions that political parties put forward. Actually, we might have a stronger vision for Europe and a stronger contribution to to make and be less the reluctant bride uh, if our own domestic situation uh, was stronger and actually carried people with it as well. Because it's not, I like your idea, it sounds like a, an important idea to stand up for your vision and, and carry people with you. But it's not clear to me at the moment in this country 
any of the political parties are carrying people with them on the domestic agenda. Yeah. Right, gosh, right, that's a new speech. Can I have a couple of weeks to write it? <laughs> um, okay, on the point about shared history, I think, I mean, I, I never really spend time thinking about the United States of Europe because I just don't see it as being possible. And the real reason I don't think it is possible is because I believe you have to have a cultural union before you can achieve a monetary union. So, you know, having been in banking for 25 years, I have nightmares about the future for the euro because I do genuinely believe that um, currency unions can't be imposed upon a lack of a cultural union. So in answer to your specific question, we don't have a shared language, we don't have shared customs and cultures. In fact, our history is very bloody, not very conciliatory in Europe. So I think there's all sorts of things that pull against a country called Europe. History also, I mean, in the States, they had a cultural union long before they had an, a, an economic and monetary union. So I think that history tells us that um, unions that are not of culture and history are not successful. I mean, I genuinely hope, and I, I certainly don't want to be quoted as saying I think or hope the euro will collapse. I think it would be a complete disaster. And I also genuinely believe that, um, you know, that, that certainly German politicians have said they will protect the euro at any cost. That's fantastic. They have a long road to travel, but I just genuinely hope and believe that they are committed to that path. But I don't think that a United States of Europe is feasible just on the grounds of language alone and shared history, certainly not. So in terms of your other point about being able to carry people with us, I think domestic politics in the UK is going through a complete disaster um, at the moment, which is still, I think, the hangover from the... Um, expenses scandal. I mean, I was elected in May 2010, and actually, you know, I've wanted to be an MP since I was 13 years old, and my reason is because I wanted to save the world from a nuclear war. And I thought if I went into politics, then I could save the world. And I have, obviously, because I went into politics. I mean, anyway, that's, that is a joke. Please, again, don't, don't take me seriously on this. So, um, so, you know, and 2010, actually, when it was kind of imminent, I, it was my biggest wobble ever. I was thinking, why would anybody in their right mind want to do this? So I think for both politicians and for the public, there is this mutual kind of um, horror. You know, the people think politicians are just pure evil. I mean, if I showed you some of the emails I get, you know, they'd make me cry if I, you know, if I wanted to. And, and, and on the other hand, I think for a lot of MPs, there is a kind of a resentment, you know, after all oh, I've done for you, you know. And, and so at the moment we're going through a bad phase. And I also think coalition is extraordinarily difficult. You know, we've got, I mean, I don't want to make excuses, and I am making excuses, so I'll leave it there. But essentially I think we're in a down phase. I think um, certainly we're going through a painful phase of adjustment. There's a lot of reform going on. There's a lot of... Um, very difficult and unfortunate cuts going on. We need to see the economy recover. When I said, you know, for the well-being that we all crave, economic success is absolutely key to that. And I put money on the fact that if our economy turns around in the next couple of years, we will all start feeling better about politics too. So I think I agree with you. If politics was in a good state at home, we'd be able to carry people more easily in Europe. But I also think Europe, it's, it's a now or never thing. You know, for in, in my politics, it's a bit like welfare reform. If we don't do it now, we never will. And Europe is like that. It's, it's got so bad that actually all opinion polls say that Britain wants to leave. That's a disaster. I don't think we should leave. I think we should be at the heart of Europe. But it's got to be a reformed relationship. You know, as I said in my speech, the status quo is not an option. The Eurozone crisis has changed all that. European Banking Union has changed all that. Even if we wanted to, we can't stand still with our current relationship with the EU. Because if we did nothing, we'd be disenfranchised totally, potentially, by um, the end of next year. Um, I've got a few more people lined up already. There was, yes, there was a chap at the back. Um, and I've got, I think, another two. Um, my name's Ed. I'm not from anywhere in particular. Um, I just wondered whether you thought the Prime Minister, um, his stance on Europe goes far enough. And is there anything that you would like to see him doing more or less of? I mean, I think I, I thought his speech was completely spot on. I, 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 thought it was, um, I thought it was exactly the right thing to be saying because he was, he was, on the one hand, praising Europe for its achievements and making very clear that he sees Britain's future at the heart of the EU. But he was also making clear these very fundamental problems of global competitiveness, 
of a long-term decline, which is where things are forecast to be if we, if we don't change, um, the democratic deficit and so on. So I, I think his speech was spot on. In terms of has he gone far enough, the, there is a real issue with coalition government. You know, clearly, I think everybody knows the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats don't agree on Europe. And so the balance of competences work, which is going on now, which was in the part of the coalition agreement, that is looking very carefully at who does what, where does the balance of power lie, and obviously from that work there will then be conclusions drawn as to where should the balance of power lie. So in the sense of has he gone far enough, not yet, but I think he's made clear his intention to do so. And in, in many ways that also is why the 2017 deadline for the referendum, people kind of sort of criticise him for it being beyond the next general election, but the reality is it's going to be 2017 before we even see what's going to happen in the Eurozone, let alone what's going to happen um, in terms of Britain's relationship with it. I mean, to be very specific, my own ambition is to see Britain create a, a permanent multi-tier Europe where Switzerland and Norway think, yep, yeah, we'll join, okay, we'll be one of the non-European member states of the EU as well. And we'll have a very clear two, two aspects. I, I don't like to sort of create new terms. So we'll have two very clear routes to being a full member of the EU. And, and that's the kind of thing I'd like to see. And, uh, and that's sort of, I suppose, where I'd be pushing the Prime Minister go, to go. But at the moment, I think his, you know, what he has said has been spot on. Um, one more in the front here. Uh, David, isn't it? Yeah. I think. yeah. Thanks, David Morgan. Uh, when you were accused of being a single market or nothing uh, individual, you said that there was more, uh, but you, you can't talk about it. Uh, it. That's actually quite an important issue, because I think a lot of people think that behind your vision uh, of Europe, it's the... Uh, American-style free market, which puts all power in the hands of the producers, works to the advantage of the multinational companies, but the things that are objected to in Europe are those things like competition law, the rights of the consumer. So could, could you say more about what uh, this Europe should be? Yes. Um, I mean, for a start, I'm, I, I am absolutely a free marketeer, but absolutely not without checks and balances. I mean, interestingly, I think one of the biggest problems um, which the Fresh Start Project is just about to launch a paper on is the impact of the EU on micro-businesses. And, uh, you know, there, there is a clear problem for micro-businesses, and the EU doesn't actually even technically have competence to meddle in the micro-business world. Um, so, so to answer your question, um, in terms of um, justice and home affairs, what I would like to see, and I, please you know, don't misquote me as speaking for the government in any way or for the Conservative Party. I'm totally paranoid now because I've been misquoted a few times um, as speaking for David Cameron or for the government, and it's very uncomfortable. But speaking for myself, justice and home affairs, I think we should opt out entirely and we should then have a UK EU bilateral agreement that entirely reflects, for example, in the European arrest warrant, the same wording as the European arrest warrant, with two key differences. One is it doesn't have ECJ jurisdiction, and the second is it can't be changed under QMV without our ability to, to um, agree to it. So that, and, and that's really, you know, my, my vision for justice and home affairs is same with Frontex, same with, um, same with human trafficking laws. You know, justice and home affairs, absolutely essential that we cooperate, but equally essential because of Britain's common law basis, um, is that we don't have ECJ jurisdiction. I think that would be a hugely improved thing, so the cooperation is there. What else? Um, certainly in terms of um, international aid, um, cooperation on matters of international security, um, cooperation on, inter on issues of climate change, um, cooperation on, what else? Think of some more. Uh, okay. I mean, the, the things I would rule out are in the Fresh Start Manifesto for Change. So I would be looking for a repatriation of the competence for social and working time. And that is because, don't look at Britain, look at Greece. 50% youth unemployment. Now, it's not the EU's fault that they've got 50% youth unemployment. But actually, if they were able to make decisions to give young people a job for a week, you know, then that would be better than no job at all. And the problem is, in flexible labour laws, they're extremely difficult to change. 
The EU has itself tried to change some of the labour laws and has been unable to do so because it's created this nightmare of a spaghetti where the social partners are all allowed to make the decisions and of course having made the decisions they now won't unmake them. So repatriating that competence, it's not to do down workers' rights, it's simply to enable national parliaments to have flexibility. An alternative way to do it might be to be able to declare some sort of force majeure. So in the event that you've got 50% youth unemployment, you can suddenly decide as a national government we're going to suspend social and working time um, for five years. You know, something of that sort. That's the kind of reform I'd like to see. Um, I, mean, I, I don't want to sort of bore on this, but, but um, you know, the emergency breaks. You know, I, I mentioned the institutionalisation of the Luxembourg Compromise, a means for a country to protect its key national interests. I mean, with financial services, this isn't just kind of... Um, whinging about it. There are very clear examples. Um, take the clearing houses where um, the, the EU has decided if you're a clearing house and you have 5% of your turnover denominated in euros, you should be located in the eurozone. So I put it to, the, um, to a German official that actually on that basis if you do 5% of your minis in Cowley you should relocate BMW's headquarters to Oxford. And he was like, yes, I see what you mean, you have a point. But that, that's really, you know, financial services is a key area because there are many in the EU who like to blame Anglo-Saxon style capitalism for the fact that they borrowed too much and spent too much. I don't quite see the link myself, but there is that tendency. And therefore, much of the 49 directives in the financial services area coming down the track are designed to limit and harm the financial services sector. That's against Britain's national interest. It's not even to um, support the single market. So there needs to be protections. So I'm not about trying to bail out and distance ourselves. I'm about more flexibility and more ability to defend the national interest. Um, I've got one more question lined. Oh, sorry, two more questions lined, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to quickly sneak in one myself, though, which is uh, abusing my position appallingly as the chair. You, you, you listed these four areas where you'd like to see reform, and I was struck how many of them were not Europe. I mean, how many of them were British? I mean, things we could do yeah. tomorrow if we yeah. wanted to. Um, in fact, three of them basically are things that the government could, or Parliament could, decide to do. So I have, I suppose, two questions. One is, what progress have you made with those areas? I mean, if you're talking to officials in Brussels about the Brussels negotiations, I assume you're also having discussions about the Westminster or Whitehall-based mm -hmm. ones. So I just wonder yeah. how uh, positive you find people. But also, and this one's hypothetical, and therefore you won't want to answer it, if you made brilliant progress with the three Westminster-based areas, so you, you know, we hope more, <coughs> we engage more, we strengthen the scrutiny powers, but we got nowhere with the Brussels negotiations, would that be sufficient? Okay, so the second question first, absolutely not. That wouldn't be sufficient. I actually think the real key is the um, strengthening, strengthening of the yellow and orange card to a sort of an orange and red card. And um, uh, so I think that's absolutely key. I also think so is the ability to um, create more flexibility. Those things are really key um, for national sovereignty. So I've majored on the things at home, um, mainly because I think a lot of the... Uh, a, a, a lot of the problem in the democratic deficit is the fact that here we haven't focused on it enough. I think this reluctant bribe thing is a real feature of British engagement with the EU. Really since Margaret Thatcher, you know, she, she did hug the EU, you know, she negotiated the rebate, she promoted the single market, she promoted enlargement, she did a number of very fundamental, very European things and actually when anybody looks at her Bruges speech or any of her speeches, she always saw Britain at the heart of the EU. I see lots of cross faces in the room. <laughs> Obviously didn't like Margaret Thatcher. <coughs> who, who cares? Anyway, um, yeah, exactly. So the point is that um, the point is that what we need to be is far more clear about what we do want, and we've got to make those changes ourselves. So, um, so there's a lot we can do here, but it wouldn't be sufficient by any means. Um, in answer to your first question. The European Scrutiny Committee is having this inquiry into um, scrutiny, and I've given evidence to it. And, um, and to actually, be, to be very honest, the reason I agreed to do this was because it's something I want to, you know, to really look closely at. What I've been focused on previously is the research into how do different areas of EU policy affect the UK. What does it cost us? How does it benefit us? If we were going to do diff things differently, how would we do it? Rather than the democratic deficit. So actually, this has been fantastic for me. It's forced me to focus on it and to, and to sort of really formalise my opinions. 
So I have given evidence to the European Select Committee, the all-party group on EU reform that I co-chair with Thomas Doherty. Um, we'll be doing um, our own session on it, but after the European Scrutiny Committee has come up with their proposals so that we can kind of wash up, you know, follow on their coattails and see what they perhaps didn't go into enough and we can then go into that. So it's something I'm absolutely determined that we make some progress on, but you know, that it, it requires a determination yes. on the part of the government to do that too. Okay, uh, the, uh, Margaret Thatcher point, I, the BBC Parliament Channel recently showed an interview she gave in 1975, just after she became party leader, which had the most astonishingly, for those who believe in the myth of the anti-European Margaret Thatcher, an astonishingly pro-European section, including, a, a, which you mentioned at the beginning, this stuff about keeping the peace in Europe. I mean, she believed all of that. Yeah. It, was all, it was all there. Yeah. Uh, right, two final questions, which we'll take together, if that's okay, just because I've taken up all the time myself. Uh, one at the back, and then here, please. Yeah, okay. My name is Sun Young Chiam. I work in banking. Um, I think the panel, panel will probably be aware that yesterday 500 businessmen launched the Business for Britain group to try to repatriate powers from the EU and to obviously promote more flexible labour markets. I just wondered whether the Fresh Start group could perhaps consider working with um, the, the new grouping, the business grouping, to uh, uh, promote... Uh, Britain's interest in, in the EU. Mm. Um, and we'll take this second one together, if that's okay. Hi, um, my name's Kate. I'm not here for my work. Just I studied um, European politics and I also worked in the European Parliament and packed those trunks that go off to Strasbourg. So that's one of my. I'd, I'd like to know if you ever put a dead cat in there for a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Are you allowed to put a dead cat no, in there? No, tempting, but. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, the thing I was interested when you were talking was things about um, costs of some of the reforms. Some of the examples you said, like um, if MPs here did more scrutiny of proposals at that level, I was wondering how they would fit that in. Would we need more MPs? How would that work? Because I've already heard other talks saying that um, has the Parliament, oh, full, there's no time for any more scrutiny. Um, also, some of the things you said about flexibility, more opt-in and opt-out, or a multi-speed Europe. In the short term, it seems like some of that could be quite cost-intensive and expensive if you have lots of countries all popping up, uh, negotiating together, forming blocks. So I was interested in that, especially then when you started talking about the rebate and the money back, because it seems like in the short term, things could really cost a lot more to bring about some of those reforms and how might, how might you portray some of that to the public <laughs> in mm. terms of short-term costs, longer-term benefits? Mm. Mm. Well, that is an extremely good point that you make. In terms of um, scrutiny here, I mean, I sit on the Treasury Select Committee and it seems to me astonishing that we don't scrutinise financial services stuff that's coming down the track. Um, now, there's always a list, as long as you're arm, of things that we'd like to have a look at if we get round to it. Uh, but there's never anything, um, hardly ever. We had Monsieur Barnier over once, but um, only once. And so often, what happens is we get the Bank of England in to talk about the quarterly inflation report, and there's a little tiny bit on, and so how's the Eurozone doing? And he sort of says, oh, well, it's all very terrible, it's very bad. And then that's the end of it. So that's not real scrutiny. And so um, actually, it's, I don't think it's a case of more resources. It's a case of doing things, you know, reprioritizing, sort of recognizing that what, what goes on in Europe is of fundamental importance here. Um, so I don't think it has cost implications or fundamental in that sense. It's a case of doing things better. In Europe, um, I mean, I... You know, Europe is extraordinarily expensive. So, I mean, if we go into that, I mean, I didn't talk about that in here, but, um, you know, there are the extraordinary things, like we're all now required to retire at 68, but they get to retire, I think it's still at 60, and they get sort of, they get all their health care paid for, and they get all these transport budgets, and, and they get so many different perks for working out there that actually there's a massive cost saving to be made on the actual sort of people budget in the European Union, which is something that I know the Prime Minister has talked about himself. So I certainly don't think we'd need to add to the cost. I do accept your point that any change does require, um, does require extra effort. But in the end, um, there's an awful lot of uh, 
time and energy spent running around as it is. So to simply streamline things doesn't necessarily end up costing you more in the long run. And actually, specifically, some of the proposals that the Fresh Start Project are making, particularly on, for example, structural funds, a very sensible proposal where we're saying that the only countries that get structural and cohesion money should be those with 90% or less of the gross national income of the average of the other nation states so that we stop sending money to Frankfurt and they send money to London and, and we all send it to Stockholm and other sort of well-known developing countries. And so um, on that basis, we'd all get a massive refund. So actually that would reduce the headline budget. So yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of proposals that could save money, not least of which is turning Strasbourg into something else. Yes. And the question from the one about, about uh, business yes, for Britain. Yes, and business for Britain. Absolutely. And they're doing, you know, they've come out with exactly the right, um, the right words. Um, you know, and Matthew Ellett is a fantastic campaigner and we're certainly, we are already talking to them and working closely with them and I think we'll certainly be doing that, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, just before we bring it to a close, can I just flag up the, uh, the next two Hansard Society events? Uh, tomorrow evening in the Thatcher Room, uh, Angela Eagle, um, the shadow leader of the House, uh, will be speaking on building a better politics. This was the event that was due to be held last week, uh, but was postponed because of the death of Baroness Thatcher. And then on the 15th of May, Chloe Smith, the Minister for Political and Constitutional Reform, and Peter Oborn, the Chief Political Commentator at the Daily Telegraph, and others yet to be announced, will be here 15th of May, 6.30, in the Thatcher Room for the launch of what is always a, a, an annual treat, the Audit of Political Engagement 10. Um, in closing, can I thank Virginia and Luke and everyone else at the Hansard Society for organising this. The audio of tonight will be on the Hansard Society's website uh, later this week. And above all, can I thank Andrew for such an excellent, erudite, very clear outline of what needs to be done in respect of Britain's relationship with Europe. Thank you very much. Andrew.